uh, intra-aortic balloon pump, and then the um, extra membrane oxygenation, and then I'll go one by one. So that's uh, that's how uh, I uh, define nephrocardiology. Uh, basically, I want to show that nephrology and cardiovascular medicine have a huge overlap uh, between them, and this overlap can affect our clinical or research scenario in different ways. It can make it complicated, and in some cases, they can actually make it simpler. Uh, and that's uh, from those seven uh, um, parameters or seven point of views, pathophysiology, epidemiology, prevention, prognosis, diagnosis, therapy, and monitoring. And within nephrocardiology, we also have uh, risk factors and systemic diseases that involve both. Those are also the aspects that will change the uh, way that we look at the patient from a uh, clinical or research standpoint. So that's what I mean by nephrocardiology when I talk about that. Many of these aspects may be involved in what I'm going to talk about. Some of them are not relevant to this talk. So the important points that I wanted to mention about this specific uh, topic, uh, about the patient condition, those patients will go with uh, mechanical circulatory support devices. They overall have poor prognosis. They're not uh, well, well patients. So we have to consider that when we want to see the effects of, first of all, to decide which modality to use, and then whether the modality will change the outcome. Because once you have, as you know, if you divide patients to different prognosis, usually clinical trials, those who want to show the maximum effect of any modality, any medication, they try to choose the patients in the middle. Because those who have a poor prognosis, is less likely to have any improvement. Those who have a poor prognosis, less likely to have any change, but those in the middle have more room to wiggle, but these are uh, very sick patients. The other thing is that mm -hmm. all patients with advanced heart failure, those who usually have these modalities, particularly the chronic ones, they all have CKD. I mean, you see a lot in publications, patients with advanced heart failure with CKD, without CKD, uh, my opinion, in uh, to your opinion, there's no such a thing. There's no advanced heart failure, chronic advanced heart failure, patient without CKD. It might be overt, it might be covert, it might be different degrees, but they all have CKD. And actually, yesterday, if you were in the um, grand round, Dr. Uh, Canales, or our uh, colleague, very nicely explained how the, how the, sorry, <laughs> how, how the, uh, I saw that you're looking that way, I realized that you must be here. Uh, so how the uh, formulas, how the interpretations can change the way we talk about patient has all of a sudden when the ACE, uh, I mean, ASN, NKF sign a, a letter, then half of the patients who had CKD don't have anymore or vice versa. So everybody with this situation have CKD whether we uh, diagnosis or not. And then when uh, something happens such as cardiogenic shock or situations that we use those temporary devices, Everything is there for patient to develop AKI. So they're, they're, they're inflamed, they have volume uh, disturbances, they have hemodynamic disturbances, so it's very common to develop AKI. What about the device-related issues that I want to talk about before I went go to the uh, talk is that the operation that they place these devices is usually associated with uh, hemodynamic changes such as uh, volume shift, such as hypertension, blood loss, and that can in and of itself change the uh, kidney function. Uh, some other procedures, particularly the percutaneous ones, they need IV contrast. So this is another thing that affects the kidney function. And uh, some others, because those who are intravascular, again, can damage or occlude the renal artery. And that's another way that they can affect the kidney. And uh, many of them, or almost all of them, can cause hemolysis because they are in touch with the blood. Red blood cells are uh, uh, um, experiencing uh, forces and shear stress against them, and they, they explode and they um, just release the hemoglobin, and we, we can have pigment nephropathy. And 
where access can be associated with infection, which can uh, make the patient susceptible to AKI, and many of the medications that they are taking are nephropoxic. So then, with all of these, the effects of those modalities on kidney function, when we want to talk about that, we have to consider that all these factors are also, so the patient has CKD to begin with, and all these factors are associated with just doing the device. So it's not just the hemodynamic changes that the device is going to uh, make. And then about the published studies that we have about these things, not necessarily about the mechanical circulatory support devices, but the ones that to some extent, somehow they address the nephrocardiologic aspects that I want to talk about. I want to tell you that as, as you hear from me uh, a lot, just complaining about the publications that are out there, uh, uh, you have to consider that serum creatinine depends on multiple factors. It's not just uh, rate of clearance from the uh, blood by the kidney. And even rate of clearance, as again, Dr. Canales nicely mentioned, is not everything that kidney does. But it depends on muscle mass, it depends on dilution, many other things. Whereas I will show you, and you have seen that many of these studies when creatinine goes up, worsening kidney function when creatinine comes down, oh, they're good to the kidney, whereas it's not necessarily the case. So uh, AKI has been defined differently in this study. Some of them just use the Kim criteria, which in and of itself has a lot of flaws and some others. So how much creatinine goes up, comes down, and again, that's why you can see discrepancies and you can't come up with a, a definite conclusion. Uh, and again, we need that definite conclusion because the hemodynamic effect is one side, but all of those other things that I just talked about are the other side of the story that can affect uh, the uh, kidney function and the kidneys possibly negatively. And then uh, the AKI that we have, if it's really AKI, increasing pregnancy, whatever, is it? at least two completely different categories. Some of them are just hem hemodynamic changes. Let's say you have venous congestion, you have hypoperfusion or whatever that can be reversible much easier because you can correct the hemodynamic. But if it goes further than that, then you have necrosis and ATN, then the prognosis and everything and the whole clinical scenario is different. So those are all the th things that we have to consider. 99.999999% of the publications, they haven't even considered any of these. They just see that, uh, you know, crappy goes up, down, or kidney is getting better or worse, and they have been published in the highest impact journals that uh, it's hard to believe. But anyway, what I want to say that the important point to remember is high quality studies and reliable evidence is very limited for nephrocardiologic aspects of uh, mechanical circulatory support devices and interpretation of the results of studies are frequently flawed because of the same reasons that I said, and I don't care if they are published in New England Journal of Medicine or uh, case report journal of, uh, I don't know, lunar uh, medicine, whatever, but they are flawed. Okay, so what we want to talk about mechanical circulatory support devices I want to divide them into two long-term or those that are surgically implanted and short-term that those are uh, usually percutaneously implanted. And then these are the subcategories of each that I will get into one by one. Uh, let's start with uh, left ventricular assist devices. So nephrocardiologic aspects of um, LVAD. So as you all know, this is how LVAD works. It's surgically implanted. There is a cannula here that uh, takes the blood from the left ventricle and then uh, pumps it into the aorta. There is a percutaneous drive line coming out of the body from the abdomen, the abdominal one, and it is uh, attached to a controller. And the controller is also attached to two batteries that patient hears like this. And this has a few duties. First of all, you can make your adjustments. Where, for example, you can increase the rate or, or, or power that you want to use for the LVAT. And it also have, has some alarms. For example, if you don't have enough uh, flow or anything, is well, batteries are going low, it's alarmed so that the patient knows to change the batteries or whatever needs to be done. So that's how it uh, in general looks. And that's how it looks inside. As you can see, there's inflow cannula. Uh, there is a pump here. And then this is the outflow that is usually uh, at the uh, um, ascending aorta before the uh, brachiocephalic artery branches off. That's how it works, and that's that's the wire that we just talked about. 
Uh, there are two types of these pumps. Some of them are like this, pulsatile. Some of them are uh, continuous flow. Pulsatile is trying to mimic what the heart does, just pumps the blood in pulse, pulsing uh, uh, fashion, but this one is just continuous. There are different pros and cons. These are usually bigger. They are very noisy. They are less durable um, and uh, have been shown to be associated with less durability and less, uh, uh, I mean, worse uh, prognosis and more mortality. Uh, however, they are mimicking the normal type of blood flow that we have, which is pulsatile. And from that standpoint, they should be better. These are uh, more um, smaller and less noisy. And then they are uh, more uh, associated with uh, blood clot though. But like I said, the concern about these, well, first of all, after, after these came out, pretty much all of the LVAS nowadays are continuous. So there's no pulsatile anymore. Uh, and uh, the continuous flows, uh, the concern for some time, a few years ago, everybody thought that because it's not pulsatile, so it doesn't cause shear stress on the endothelium that is used to this build for having that type of shear stress. And therefore, we will have endothelial dysfunction and everything comes from that. But that uh, theory is not uh, really well received today, but even though it might have some effects, but we don't ha really have much of evidence about that. Uh, but after, after that, they, they came up and started to make these type of still continuous flow, but this is centrifugal. So this is called axial, and this is centrifugal, still continuous flow though. So the pros and cons is that uh, basically th this one actually, like you said, is, um, which I think I uh, said in the last slide, uh, I meant to say that this one has more blood class com compared to centrifugal, not compared to the uh, pulsatile. And this has a better uh, uh, power or better ability to, uh, empty the uh, left ventricle and pump it better. And if you even look at the um, me um, fluid mechanics, physics literature, they talk about the same thing for water pumps. Those that are centrifugal, they have a better power and they can just uh, remove the water better. It's good and at some and, and some cases could be bad. We have to be cautious about it. And I will talk about that. Uh, but also it's thought that this one has uh, more pulsatile properties than the axial, uh, the, the centrifugal. So now these are also <laughs> very much uh, popular. So when, when an LVAD is uh, implanted, as you know, there are two or three different goals for that. Sometimes the patient has no chance of receiving a, a heart transplant. And so that's destination therapy. They have it until they can have it. Uh, usually not that long, six months, a year, two years. Even though I, right here, and uh, before I've had, right here, I have a patient who has had an LVAD for 14 years, and he, he is almost 85, and he's doing fine. He's, he's physically active. But sometimes it's bridge to transplant, so they put it until the patient on the waiting list finds a transplant, and sometimes they put it to see what happens, whether the patient gets better, and sometimes they put it for bridge to transplant, and I have had patients, and I have patients who remove the LVAD, and they're fine afterwards. So this is something uh, temporary. For example, patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy has happened. I had a number of patients with that uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy that's uh, improved and the LVAD was taken off. So what are important points that the nephrologists need to know about LVAD? So like I said, kind of nephrocardiology aspects. So we have to know that LVAD are very much preload dependent and very much afterload dependent. If you look at this, see this is the cannula that comes out of the left ventricle and this is the pump that pumps it here. Just imagine here, this is sucking the blood out. So you need to have enough blood here to be able to suck it out. And if you don't have, it goes wrong. And here you need to have a certain amount of afterload. Let's say you drop the afterload all of a sudden, just imagine this pump is working, working, and all of a sudden, there's no uh, no resistance here. That also causes a problem with the uh, hemodynamics of the LVAD. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have enough volume here, remember the controller gives you an alarm, which is called low flow alarm. And if you don't do something about that, 
it can go really wrong because it, imagine you don't have enough fluid, uh, blood here to the point that it can suck both sides of the ventricle next to each other and it can obliterate the left ventricle literally. And not only obliteration, but also that can cause severe ventricular uh, fatal arrhythmias. And these patients usually have ICD and others, but still it can be fatal. And that's one uh, picture I, I found in this, and it's a case report, and in favor of case report, as you know, uh, I love case reports. And this is, you know, you can see in this case, almost the two sides of the left ventricle are just attaching to each other. And that's the uh, phenomenon that is called suction event. And that's the very dangerous part that we need to be aware of if you have a patient. Remember, as nephrologists, we are in charge of patients' volume status, whether the patient is on dialysis or off dialysis. So this is very important to know if you have, I have a number of patients with LVAD that I've had throughout the years, and those are the things you have to consider. And uh, I will talk about the, the ways to uh, adjust it. One is patient's volume, and the other thing is adjustment of the pump features. That is the, the spa, spa, uh, speed of the pump and the power of the pump. The more the speed, the more the power, the more it needs fluid to be pumped. If there is no way to control that for some patients, then we need to coordinate with the LVAT team to adjust the parameters, but that comes with other hemodynamic problems. So uh, basically this is a very, very tiny thread that we have to walk on. The other thing that everybody knows is that blood pressure measurement is challenging, particularly nowadays that they're all continuous flow. Still, sometimes you can feel pulse, still sometimes you can hear uh, systole and diastole because heart is pumping as well. But it depends on the percentage of the work that is being done by heart and by the pump, this varies. But usually if you want to check blood pressure, the regular cortical uh, sounds are not reliable, even though sometimes my patients come and the nurses just record some blood pressure. It is there, I mean, they can hear, it's not that they are just not hearing anything because the heart's still pumping, but that's not the real, uh, real pressure that is in effect. The real pressure is mean arterial pressure, which is because it's a continuous flow, and that's how to measure it. As you know, you have to put the cough here and then use an ultrasound and what we call return to flow, the, and then deflate the cough gradually as soon as the first wave comes, that's the mean arterial pressure, and that's what perfuses the uh, organs in the body, and that's what we have to know. So that's the challenge that we have to know how to measure it, not uh, which is with return to flow, and not just how to measure it, but also what is the target. Again, as nephrologists, not only we are in charge of patient's kidney function, we're in charge of patient's volume, we are in charge of patient's blood pressure. So we need to know what blood pressure is, what is the good blood pressure. Their target is not 130 over 80. Their target is mean arterial pressure or return to flow of whatever, let's say 85, 90, 80, depending on what other situations. And it, it very much depends on the other situations that you need to be familiar with other cardiovascular and hemodynamic situations of the patient to see what the, uh, the target blood pressure is and to adjust that blood pressure. Again, it's not just your antihypertensive medications, but it's also the management of the volume and management of the pump. So the pump parameters has have to be adjusted correctly along with your management of the volume so that you get to the right mean arterial pressure that that patient needs. So that's the complexity of uh, these patients. So we need to know that they have hemolysis because of the sheer stress to the red blood cells that are in touch with the pump. And that comes with the consequences. First of all, these are CKD patients. They are already anemic, and this is going to intensify their anemia. So then we have to find out what to do with that. And we, I mean, I don't know if this special, but we can talk about that. But the patients have CKD, which makes them prone to anemia. They have heart failure, which is also associated with uh, anemia. And they are having hemolysis as well. And I will tell you one other reason that they might be anemic. So that's one, one of the important consequences of hemolysis. And the other one is that we can have pigment nephropathy. So you have to, to you know, uh, regularly check their uh, hemolysis parameters in the blood to make sure that they are not. I mean, you don't need to do that. Usually the, uh, the LVAT team does that. That's part of the protocol they check because we don't want them to hemolyze too much, not just because of uh, pigment nephropathy, but also for 
a heavy um, uh, anemia. And if that is happening, so there are ways to deal with that. Again, some of them are the uh, parameters of the pump or even, even the surgery. Remember, there are so many different factors. For example, the angle of the inflow at the bottom of the left ventricle, how the blood is going to touch the pump. And the, all those things are involved. So with the adjustments of those parameters, uh, LVAT team can help us to decrease the amount of hemolysis. And then you have to remember they have a synthetic material. They are prone to infect, and it's very important for, let's say, when we want to dialyze the patients. And then patients are anticoagulated. So we have to remember anyone with LVAT have, is on anticoagulation of some form, and that can, first of all, uh, um, increase the risk of bleeding, that can still increase the anemia and other risks that we're aware of. So those are the main things that we need to know as basics of uh, LVAT as nephrologists. How about renal replacement therapy? As you uh, probably know, if GFR is too low, kind of, contraindicated for placing the LVAD. And that's what they try to, but it's not always the case. Sometimes they put an LVAD with low GFR. But then the question is, so if that's the case, why do we see patients with LVAD who come to us for dialysis? And the point is that many of them develop end stage or get worse after placing the LVAD because of the reasons that we talked. So after the surgery, after the LVAD is in place, the kidney function gets worse, they become end-stage kidney disease, and that's why they need dialysis. So let's say we have a patient on LVAD, and it doesn't come to us with LVAD, but we know that now is end-stage, and we want to put the patient on some sort of renal replacement therapy after stabilization. So what's what's why what's the rationale for GFR less than 30 with a contraindication? I mean, different things. One is, for example, because they think that if you do dialysis with LVAD, it's a higher risk of infection, higher risk of hemodynamic changes, and it's not necessarily likely that you can get the uh, uh, heart kidney transplant soon enough. That type of you know rationale, but but it's not in practice. I mean, I have many patients who get the LVAD when it's even lower, but many of them who are on dialysis they develop afterwards. So let's say we are the one who want to decide what we want to start for the patient, hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. After stabilization, obviously, initially, we may start CRT. So the points about LVAD and hemodialysis, first of all, it needs trained team in your dialysis unit. We have sometimes patients come and then uh, everybody is uh, afraid of them. They need to know how to measure blood pressure. They need to know the basics of hemodynamics. They need to know how to troubleshoot if they hear some alarm. All those type of things, at least those who are directly working with the patient. So that's that's a limitation. And another thing is that uh, sometimes because of the incentives and stuff, you know, people don't really like to have these patients. So if they have dialysis catheter, Risk of bloodborne infection is high, and a patient with LVAD does not do good with uh, bloodborne infection. So that's that's something to consider. And then for vascular site, you usually have a problem. If you want to say, okay, a catheter doesn't work, but let's do uh, AV fistula or AV graft. Usually these patients are sick, long-term uh, CKD, long-term cardiovascular disease. They have had multiple right heart casts, left heart casts. So the vasculature is not well preserved for placing an AV fistula. So that's uh, emphasize the fact that so then if we have a patient with CKD, particularly if there is heart failure, this vein preservation strategies have to be even more emphasized for those patients because they need that. So that's another issue with the axis. And then there's a concern about maturity of the axis because there's no pulsatile flow. The thought is that because this is not pulsatile, the, the um, AV fistula may not mature as well because of that theoretical endothelial dysfunction. And again, that's theoretical. There's some studies, weak studies, as uh, I mentioned, and I will tell you. If you have Concern, uh, if you have, if you want to say, okay, I will go for, for the AV fistula, not only you don't find any uh, vessel and it doesn't mature, also AV fistula, AV graft, as you know, imposes a lot of extra burden on the heart. High output cardiac 
failure, right? So the heart is already failed. You have an LVAD, which is preload and afterload dependent, and now you're adding a short circuit that needs a lot of work. So that's uh, another concern for the access. And then uh, if you have rapid hemodynamic changes that you have in hemodialysis, you remove water, water from patients, all of a sudden you decrease preload and you decrease afterload, both, because blood pressure drops. So that can cause things like suction effect and fatal arrhythmia, as those things that I said, and in dialysis unit, your patients are not, uh, your staff are not really uh, well trained about that. So those are the things we have to consider if you want to choose to put the patient on hemodialysis. Uh, how about peritoneal dialysis? So let's say, okay, we'll, we will start peritoneal dialysis. What are the pros and cons for a patient on with LVAD? So having a trained dialysis team is less of an issue because the patient is taking care of his or her LVAD at home to the extent that the patient needs to know. And the patient doesn't do dialysis there. It just goes, there. yes, they should need to know the nephrologist necessarily, definitely needs to know the basics, but it's not as important because that's, you're not making all those changes during the dialysis. So uh, the risk of bloodborne infections is less compared to someone who has a, a, a catheter for hemodialysis. So that's, that's a good thing. Anything that we talked about, the availability, maturation, uh, probability of a fistula or AV graft is not an issue when you have a PD. So that's a good thing. And hemodynamic changes are slow. You don't rapidly do uh, ultrafiltration. So that's good. So that's less of an effect. So, so far, PD appears to be a good option for them if they qualify. Another issue was that when you put the LVAD, you may you just damage the peritoneal cavity and you want an in intact peritoneal cavity to be able to do PD. But the good news is that the newer LVADs and the newer surgical uh, uh, procedures, they do not touch the peritoneal cavity. And many of the surgeons are aware that they should make sure that the peritoneal cavity remains intact. So you can start PD. So that's also another good thing about PD. So pretty much PD is a good option if the patient qualifies. One important thing is that you have to consider the intra-abdominal pressure, which is very important in these patients. Why? Because of this, sorry, I just found this uh, on Google to just show the concept. What does intra-abdominal pressure do? If it goes up, it puts pressure on vena cava and it decreases the preload. LVAD is preload dependent. And if you do that, you go to that cycle of low volume and suction event. This one, and again, I found these pictures from three different places. So that's how you can see several different uh, references. You know, this is how intra-abdominal pressure is in patients with uh, peritoneal dialysis, right? When they are laying down is the least, standing is a little bit more, sitting is the maximum pressure. So that's the problem when the patients, and I have had patients, when they're laying down and they have LVAD overnight, and then they suddenly sit. All of a sudden, from a low pressure, they go to a high pressure. What happens? Decreases, put pressure on the inferior vena cava, decreases, the alarm goes off, and the patient freaks out, and the patient is at home. So that's very important to remember. If you want to start a patient on PD, remember, first of all, the last feel or whatever you want to put when the patient stands up or sits up has to be adjusted. And the other way, like I said, that you can adjust the hemodynamics is one is the preload and afterload, and the other one is the pump uh, parameter. So you can coordinate with your LVAD team, with your heart failure team to adjust the parameters of the LVAD so that it does not need as much fluid. And you have to train the patient that they are not supposed to sit up because all of a sudden from the lowest, to the highest pressure and that's not uh, good. Whereas the rest of the PD is a gentle process that's, that's uh, really good. Uh, how about acute kidney injury after LVAD implantation? So about 10 to 45% of the patients develop uh, AKI after implantation of the LVAD. And you can see what I just told you, 10 to 45% because who knows what is acute kidney injury. And then uh, what are the potential etiologies for 
uh, AKI after implantation, immediately after implantation of the ALBA, you can have hypotension because of anemia, bleeding, sepsis, and then kidney hypoperfusion. You can have hemolysis and pigment nephropathy. You're using nephrotoxins. You have inflammatory milieu, and you can have atherothromboi and atheroemboli. And as you know, these are all the factors that are involved in any CSA AKI, right? Cardiac surgery associated AKI, which is a known entity. We can talk about it. So cardiac surgery associated AKI, these are all involved. And you, this is like any other surgery. But there's one specific issue about LVAD, and that is post LVAD decompensated right heart failure. Remember, usually when you have left heart failure, you have right heart failure as well. So your left right heart is failed, and all of a sudden you are increasing the burden by putting an L-band. So the failing heart, all of a sudden increased burden. So the right heart becomes failed. You will have central venous congestion. Your kidney will be damaged with that. So that's one additional thing that you have to consider. If your patient is going to put an l you have to manage this with the coordination with them. So how to prevent that? So avoidance of perioperative hypotension, talking to anesthesiologists, make sure there's no bleeding, medications are adjusted, minimizing hemolysis. And minimizing hemolysis, like I said, they have other way, different ways to do that. For example, one is if you have a good surgeon, they know which angle to put the inflow so that the red cells are not crashed against the inflow and the, those type of things. And, uh, and also, you know, the, the speed of the pump, the power of the pump, all those are uh, influential in the amount of hemolysis that you can have. And then you want to avoid nephrotoxins as we put on uh, every single note that we write. And then uh, we have to prevent or manage right heart failure different ways, adjusting uh, the volume, make sure that we don't start the uh, LVAD with a very intense uh, power, and then giving diuretics, have a good volume. And in some cases, we need to put a right ventricular assist device. So uh, the important points uh, that we have to remember before going to what, what LVAD does to the kidney function in longer uh, term than just the acute kidney injury right after that. One is that the published studies are retrospective, small number, short follow-up, very poor quality. So I'm just making you ready for what I want to present la later, what happens to the kidney function after uh, placing the LVAD besides the uh, immediate AKI. And then uh, they usually studied markers of the kidney function, creatinine, BUN, and like we all know they're very, very uh, flawed. They, they may not even necessarily show in the kidney function. And uh, different etiologies may contribute to rise in creatinine, so it's not necessarily uh, kidney injury or worsening kidney function. So how, how does studies report this? What does that show? Most studies have shown that EGFR initially goes up within the first one, two, three weeks. What does that mean? It means that creatinine comes down. Is it necessarily EGFR? Who knows? Not necessarily, but you just put it in the formula, spits out the number, the number is higher. We say that EGFR is better. So, and it doesn't, it doesn't sound wrong because you think that you have better hemodynamics, you expect the kidney to work better. There's a better perfusion. After a month, however, three to four weeks, it starts to come down again gradually. Basically, creatinine starts to go up gradually. Again, I, I, I say GFR coming up or down because that's how they reported it, but I don't believe that it's necessarily GFR. And this is one study, for example, published in Jack in three patients. And as you can see, this is one month. It's going up, basically crap and coming down. But after that starts to come down, after six months, still a little bit higher than what it was at the beginning, but has started to come down. And if you look at this, whether they had a GFR of more than 60 or less than 60 at the beginning, they still go the same way, go up for, for the first three to four weeks and then come down. And then this is the same study and they show how 
the CKD state changes, and as you can see, most of them after a month become stage one, and stage four and five are disappeared, stage three and four. And, and you know how meaningless this is. And this is this is Jack, the highest impact journal in cardiology and impact factor 48. If you have a CKD stage four, CKD means that there's a damage that is not reversible by definition, by concept. So if your creatinine comes a little bit lower, it don't mean it doesn't mean that your CKD has come from stage four to stage one. There's no such a thing conceptually, but that's that's what we are dealing with. Um, anyway, if you want to go just by semantics, yes, creatinine comes down to the level that okay it passes the uh, cut point between stage three and four. It gets better after a month, but then gradually goes up. Another study, same thing. Uh, it goes up and then comes down. And GFR, which is crap, it goes down and then goes up. So, how does association of change in serum creatinine with how does it do to the heart outcome? What, what, what is the best? Interestingly, this is a study that shows that if you have moderate increase in GFR, means moderate decrease in serum creatinine, GFR increased by 22 to 47%, that's associated with the best mortality uh, outcome. And that's from the uh, intermix uh, registry, over 3,300 uh, 3, patients. That's the, the registry of the patients with elevated molecular they were uh, doing this study. Look at this. This green line shows those, anyway, it shows those with 22 to 40 something. And this one, look at this, 88%. So red line, the worst, worst, uh, outcome is those who had the most improvement, so to speak, of GFR. So if you improve the kidney too much, then they do the worst. And again, you can see how these interpretation, these, yeah, you can, you can come up with a number of different uh, explanations for that. But we don't want to believe that if you improve the kidney rapidly, it that's worse, you should not improve the kidney. So that's why I'm saying that these numbers, these interpretation are all full of flaws. And you can see the big names of journals here. Okay. So what are the mechanisms for rising in creatinine after the third or fourth week? And these are some mechanisms that have been suggested by others or by yours truly. So, and the field of the function, like I said, because there's no pulsatile flow, and that was uh, very much uh, popular at some point. They did a few studies, like I told you this one, for example. They compared continuous flow and pulsatile flow, and you can see both of them, uh, initially it goes up, and after a month it comes down, no matter what. There is a problem here, there is a, a, a time bias, There's because it's a kind of a historical cohort, because most of those with uh, pulsatile flow are late, earlier. Uh, uh, LVAT patient. These are later, but still the exact same pattern. Four weeks and then comes down. Another one, same thing, whether it's continuous or pulsatile. They still do the same. So, is that, yeah, theoretically you think that you need a good endothelial function, but how much this pulsatile thing works, we don't. The other potential uh, reason could be that. Kidney function is gradually decreasing. Initially, you just give a better perfusion, so it cleans the blood better, creatinine comes down, but then gradually kidney was getting worse and it's getting worse. The other explanation is that when you put the LVAT, patient does better, eats better, throws more muscle mass, so it's producing more creatinine, not removing less creatinine. So that's why creatinine goes up, and then we interpret that as decrease in GFR. The other explanation is that the marrow can adjust to this more pressure through the uh, tubular glomerular uh, uh, feedback or other feedbacks and then adjust themselves to this hyperperfusion and again starts to come down in GFR. The other explanation is that pigment nephropathy gradually damages the kidney because of the hemolysis. The other explanation could be that post LVAD you will have right heart failure and that's why you have venous congestion and does that. Another explanation is that you restart ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and uh, those medications that can uh, decrease the GFR, 
Another explanation is that you start to give them other medications, things that are nephrotoxic, they do heart cath and stuff, and that gradually worsens the kidney. So there are many different explanations, could be all of above, none of above, or some uh, combination of those and others. But again, that's how I'm saying that serum creatinine doesn't necessarily mean GFR doesn't necessarily mean kidney function. So the summary for LVAT is that uh, improvement of cardiovascular hemodynamics in the severely sick patient population is expected to help kidneys, which are very much dependent on the adequate perfusion. That's what we expect. And the studies that have with all those flaws, uh, even though the process of insertion of the device can be associated with adverse impact on kidney because of the reasons that I mentioned, Overall, short-term impact of heart failure device on kidney function appears to be favorable, means that the number of creatinine comes down. Uh, and we interpret that as favorable effect on the kidney. And the long-term effects are uh, less favorable as far as we can tell based on those the raw numbers and those uh, flawed interpretations. And uh, it's unclear whether transition to pulsatile triurable LVADs will favorably affect it, but that was what was the theory initially that because it's just a continuous flow, but uh, there's no evidence that if we go back to those pulsatile, which has all those limitations, they're heavy, they're big, they're noisy, they're less durable, if it does anything good to the kidney. So the only change that has been made is that now we have centrifugal instead of uh, axial, um, not but not true pulsatile. And then nephrologists and dialysis staff who take care of patients with LVAD need to know some basics of mechanical circuitry support devices and the interaction with dialysis and other pathology related issues. So let's go to short term or percutaneous implanted uh, ventricular assist devices. Uh, uh, we have those ventricular assist devices. There are two types again, microaxial and extracorporeal centrifugal. I, I just mentioned what, what that means. Microaxial is within the axis and uh, centrifugal is the other way. Um, and if this centrifugal uh, usually is outside of the body, but if it's microaxial, these temporary ones that are percutaneously so that they stay within the vessel, the big vessels. So let's talk about these. Um, you can see there are several different ways. This one was the one that came first, uh, that we call it impella. And basically it's the same as what Elbad does from the uh, left atrium. It just sucks the blood and then put it into the aorta after the aortic valve. So the same uh, manner, but the uh, surgically implanted was surgically coming out and then goes this, this one is just pumping this way. This was, this was just really, really uh, good when it came out. And actually the, the company that is making this, I cannot tell the name because of this being the CME, uh, just the stock went up by I think 400 times or something like that. I remember some of our cardiology fellows at the time were saying, oh, why did I spend so much money to become a cardiologist? I should have bought some of the stuff and now I would have millions of dollars for the rest of my life. And, and that's actually true. If, if the only reason to study cardiology is to make money, uh, that would have been a better way to do that. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's, that's what Impella does. But there are other types of uh, that as well. This is what is called tandem heart. This goes from the inferior vena cava through the interatrial septum goes here and uh, pushes the blood. And this one uh, also goes from, uh, basically this is kind of RP, Impella RP, which is the same as Impella, but for right heart. So from the uh, vena cava gets and pushes into the pulmonary artery. So basically all of them are trying to temporarily be placed from the uh, percutaneously and temporarily improve the hemodynamics. So I don't go to detail of each of them and there's not that much study, even the studies that exist, I told you how, how good they are. But um, overall, I put them all together and they are all doing, trying to improve the hemodynamics of the heart in acute setting with the percutaneous, percutaneous in place, uh, placement of that. And that's uh, another example, I, like I told, this is the centrifugal uh, that you know, the catheters are inside, but the pump is outside and it's centrifugal, it's not a microaxial. So um, these, these percutaneous or temporary VADs, uh, ventricular assist devices, are used in two different occasions. One is that if the patient is extremely sick in the ICU, they just want to uh, save the patient's life. And the other one is used um, prophylactically. When the patient is undergoing some procedure that is 
increasing the risk of hypoperfusion, kidney failure, uh, and so on. So for example, in the cath lab for high risk cabbage, for EP lab, those type of things, which they use it uh, prophylactically. So what are the effects of that on when they're used prophylactically on the development of uh, AKI? Uh, there are a few studies, again, not so good. This one is by Ro Roxana Moran. I don't know if you know her. She's a cardiologist up in New York who uh, who does a lot about uh, contrast induced nephropathy, which uh, today they like to call it contrast associated AKI. So uh, they developed, their group developed a score to predict what is the risk of contrast induced nephropathy in someone who undergoes a high risk PCI or, or any PCI. And then this study, they don't have a control group, but they compared the actual uh, number of uh, AKI cases to what would be based on their risk score. And they used Impella in all patients. And when, when they used Impella, prophylactically, they saw that, okay, compared to their risk score, uh, there's, there's a big difference uh, when you use Impella. And again, there's no control group, it's just the risk score. And this is uh, divided that into different, uh, the same score, the Meron score, different Meron scores. All of them, if you have um, an, L, uh, um, an Impella, you have less AKI compared to what the score would predict. And the uh, same for baseline GFR. No matter what GFR you are, the number of AKIs are less than what would be predicted by Meron score. So they concluded that, okay, Impella is, is good. Uh, to decrease the AKI when you are doing high-risk uh, percutaneous coronary intervention, high-risk PCI. Uh, this is another study. This one, they did have a control group, 115, 115, with and without Impella. Again, it's high-risk percutaneous coronary intervention. And again, they showed that uh, the control group that would not have uh, Impella in place developed more uh, AKI in different stages of AKI, uh, so to speak, that's based on the key criteria. So again, they concluded that putting an Impella uh, prophylactically for high-risk PCI helps increase the number of AKIs. And uh, this one also shows the same thing. Control goes up. When you have Impella, it doesn't go up crap, it doesn't go up that much after the second day, but they both start to come down, but after the third day, it's still the one who's a lot of low ones, right, I think, uh, whatever it means. And that's also the uh, dividing the, those with uh, different GFRs, and again, the number of patients who develop AKI or those who develop AKI that needs hemodialysis is less when you have Impella, those uh, orange bars and this uh, red line. But if you don't have Impella, then you have more AKI, more need for dialysis. But the factors that they found to be associated with AKI, well, Impella support decreases the AKI, better ejection fraction decreases the risk of AKI after high risk PCI again. And then better GFR decreases the risk of AKI. And, uh, and again, remember this is a key criteria as well. Um, obviously, if you have a lower creatinine, you are. And then procedure time, if you have longer procedure time, or if you have more contrast material, you have higher risk of AKI, which is, uh, again, expected. So part of a summary for percutaneous VADs is that, like other VADs, we expect them to help with kidney function because they're helping with the hemodynamics. Um, studies suggest that uh, PFAD uh, decreases the incidence of AKI following high-risk PCI, despite the fact that uh, for placement of the uh, um, PBAD, you need to use some contrast, and that exposure is offset by the beneficial effects. Um, so how about intraortic balloon pump? Uh, we've seen that a lot. This is how it looks. They uh, place it usually from right femoral artery. They go all the way up. The balloon ends right before the uh, right after the uh, branching of the left uh, subclavian artery, and it is supposed to be inflated when it's diastole and deflated when it's systole, so that in systole part, part can pump the blood out, but during diastole, which is the time that the myocardium is supposed to be well perfused, it inflates so that you have a better perfusion of the myocardium, so that not only in, increases the better perfusion, 
that not only increases the cardiac output, but also causes better relaxation of the muscle. So you will have decreased uh, end diastolic pressure as well. So basically, IABP uh, improves the oxygenation of the heart, improves, it improves the oxygen demand and supply curve by both ways. Obviously, it increases myocardial oxygen supply because during the diastole, it inflates and increases the blood flow to the coronary arteries, but it also decreases the myocardial demand by the mechanisms that I mentioned. So you have a better <clears throat> coronary perfusion, and then your cardiac output goes up, but also your left ventricular and diastolic pressure goes down because the muscle can be relaxed better. You have less wall stress, therefore you have less myocardial oxygen demand. So less demand, more supply, of, uh, cardiac muscle gets better oxygen. So that's what the basis for that is. But the studies, again, like, the other one, this one is kind of old, but the newer ones are not much better. And as you can see, there's only, I don't know, seven or eight cases. And they were trying to uh, study the blood, uh, uh, renal blood flow, renal to delivery, and renal to consumption. And um, as you can see, there's nothing here to tell me whether it's significant or not. Some of them went up, some of them came down, some of them didn't do anything. And the number is so low that you don't expect to get any, any uh, good results from that. Uh, so basically, there was no immediate beneficial effect on renal perfusion, oxygen delivery, or oxygen consumption after one-on-one, -on -one, uh, one-to-one IABP in patients in cardiogenic shock who were already receiving inotropic support and low-dose dopamine infusion. So that didn't do much into the kidney parameter, these kidney parameters, but again, in only seven or eight patients. Uh, any benefits on uh, renal perfusion or function in this situation? is likely due to longer term indirect effect of improvement in coronary perfusion and in the small improvements in cardiac output and left atrial pressure. And uh, we can see that pre-pump, after pump, during pump, everything comes down. Obviously when you put it in formula, GFR goes up and then comes down, but <clears throat> it's not significant. But in the same study, they measured the <coughs> interlobar renal blood flow, that was uh, increased when you were using IAPP, which is which, which you expect because you have a better perfusion. So interlobar um, blood flow increased, but uh, it did not uh, result in sig statistically significant decrease in serum creatine, which uh, again, even if it did, I don't know what it meant. Uh, so th another study, and it's showing the organ failure, uh, Okay, so yeah, so these are patients who were already on ECMO and they added uh, uh, interotic balloon pump. Organ failure in most of the organs did not change much, including the kidney. So adding IBP to ECMO in patients with cardiogenic shock didn't do much to decrease the number of kidney failures. So uh, that's the same thing it is uh, mentioning. And then that's another study, same thing. Uh, AKI did not decrease when you uh, add IADP, sorry, it's uh, for high risk cabbage. Uh, and this is one case report that we said that the patient was doing much worse after placing the intraortic balloon pump, and then they realized that there is a balloon right next to the renal artery orifice. I can't see that balloon. I, to be honest, I looked at it with cardiologists and with a number of radiologists, you know, you know, saw it. but I can see the arrow here. So assuming that there is a pump here, the uh, renal artery orifice is closed. So not good blood pressure, good blood perfusion. And that's why the kidney can move. So we have to make sure that they don't put their balloon here. Uh, and then this is a uh, so-called meta-analysis. In okay. incidence of post op HVI with a high risk cabbage with IADP. Each of the studies didn't show, but the, the majority in this forest plot, you can see that the diamond is here in favor of less AKI for high risk cabbage if you use uh, IADP. And uh, they have done this for off pump cabbage, same thing. And uh, the number of uh, RRTs needed also with IABP in just a few studies that have been reported. Looks like the IABP is decreasing, but again, like I said, we have to take all of these with a grain of salt and maybe a little bit more pepper. 
uh, mortality, same. Each of them don't show, but the, you know, the, the total, we can see that it improves the mortality after high risk cabbage uh, eating IIBP. And so pre cabbage prophylactic IIBP reduced the incidence of AKI and short term death and markedly decreased the incidence of post operative RRT requirement by 82%. Summary for IIBP again, like others, you expect to improve the hemodynamics and improve the kidney function. Uh, study suggests that IIPB decreases mortality, incidence of AKI, and incidence of RRT following high risk cabbage. However, in cardiogenic shock, uh, it's less uh, clear uh, whether the kidneys will benefit from IIPB or not, but they may. And uh, malposition of the IIPB if you block the renal artery, obviously, is not good. And then uh, finally, uh, a few words only about ECMO. Um, as you know, this is how ECMO works. There's a inflow from one big vein and goes to the pump. And then there is a, a chamber here ca called oxygenator. Blood is oxy oxygenated and CO2 is uh, taken from the blood. And then it goes back to the body. It can go back to an artery or to a vein. So VV ECMO is venovenous. Veno arterial is veno, or v, VA is veno arterial ECMO. When it's veno arterial, it's just trying to help with the pumping as well. So the basic cardiopulmonary bypass, when it's veno venous, it's only uh, mainly um, aiming at oxygenating and removing the CO2, not necessarily pumping the blood because they're both from vein to vein. Okay. Uh, AKI and ECMO, we should know that AKI is very prevalent in patients on ECMO, not just, just because of ECMO, because these patients are very high risk patient for AKI. Uh, VA ECMO, AKI is more common. It's associated with higher mortality, AKI, no surprise. And uh, there's up to 50% need for RRT. Uh, potential etiologies for AKI in patients treated with ECMO, more or less the same as I mentioned with any other cardiovascular surgery. And this, the, the, same, uh, the same factors uh, all apply here. And uh, the risk factors for poor renal outcome in one study have been shown to be if uh, GFR is lower or AKI is severe or they need more blood perfusion, blood transfusion, they do worse, and none of them are really surprising. Uh, one practical point if your patient has ECMO, like I said, over 50%, up to 50%, they may need simultaneous RRT. Usually, the patient is not stable enough for intermittent. They are on CRT. <clears throat> there are a few things that we can do practically. One is the access for uh, RRT or for our CRRT when the patient is on ECMO. It can go anywhere from this when you're using totally two different access accesses for the two. ECMO is using this, and then you're putting a different access on the other side for CRT, all the way to this. But not only you're using the ECMO access, but you're using the ECMO circuit and you're using the ECMO pump. So you don't even put a CRT machine here, just put the hemofilter, add dialysate and remove the effluents and using the ECMO pump. So anywhere in between, you can add the machine with the pump anywhere in the extracorporeal circuit that the uh, ECMO is using. And meanwhile, you can also use the uh, because both of them need uh, anticoagulation for CRT sometimes we don't use, but with ECMO, they, most of the time they do. So that can be shared. So I want to say that CRT and ECMO may share vascular access, or extracorporeal circuit, blood pump, and anticoagulation therapy. So, so the summary for ECMO, again, like others, <coughs> they expect to improve hemodynamics, not just mechanical, but also with more oxygen. So then we expect the kidney kidneys to uh, like it, but the uh, AKI uh, is very prevalent in patients on ECMO, not just because of ECMO, because of their situation with or without uh, RRT and uh, control of risk factor may, uh, when possible. Uh, I just talked about what the risk factors are, may help with ECMO, and in certain circumstances, ECMO circuit can be used for CRRT. Uh, and ECMO and CRRT can uh, also share their anti-coagulation uh, therapy, by removing CO2 and correcting respiratory acidosis, ECMO interacts with acid-based status and other aspects of nephrocardiology. So in conclusion, number of patients with advanced heart failure therapy is increasing. 
and then cardiovascular or nephrology related conditions are common. LVAD, PVAD, IPP, and ECMO improve cardiovascular hemodynamics, expected to improve the kidney function, comorbidities of advanced heart failure patients, and procedures to insert the uh, uh, mechanical circulatory support devices can adversely affect, affect kidney function and presence of uh, uh, those uh, circulatory support devices. Uh, uh, interfere with uh, nephrology related procedures such as dialysis leading to necessity of modality procedure uh, modif modification of the modality accordingly such as choosing HD or PD or uh, how much of filtration to remove all that type of thing uh, reliable evidence for the majority of the nephrocardiologic aspects of uh, uh, mechanical supervision support devices is absent and as any conclusion uh, extensive study is necessary thank you How would you consider the volume status of an LVAD patient? How would you look at a volume status and say this patient is more volume off or less volume off in the LVAD patient where can I be assessed or GDP because of uh, uh, you, you still can assess 